Hitting the go live button and I'll let you all know as soon as we're connected and I will start our program. Always just takes a moment. Okay, we should be all set. Thank you everyone for your patience for that uh, brief moment of, uh, of technical intervention there. So uh, welcome everyone to our third Thursday program uh, on this day in uh, July. We are delighted today uh, to welcome Professor Ellery Fouch of Middlebury College. Uh, Ellery is Assistant Professor of American Studies at Middlebury College. Uh, she received degrees from Wellesley College, Williams College, and the University of Pennsylvania uh, in art history. And she focuses her research uh, on material culture and art. Um, and most recently uh, has taught a class at Middlebury College on uh, the idea, the concept of relics, which she will talk a great deal more about. But one of the things produced from that class was a chair, a relic chair that duplicated a chair in the collections of the Henry Sheldon Museum of, of uh, Vermont History in Middlebury. And that original chair, the Sheldon chair, as well as the chair that um, the students in that class made are now on exhibit at the Vermont History Museum uh, through early August. If you would like to visit them, you are uh, very welcome to do that. Just check out Vermont History dot org for uh, details on visiting the museum right now we are open uh, just with some slightly limited hours and some uh, some things that we ask you to do when you enter the space so uh, with that it is my pleasure to to introduce uh, professor Fouch to you and and turn the program over to her your last reminder that this is streaming on Facebook live and if you'd like to ask any questions or address anything with me you can use the chat function of zoom so thank you Great, thanks Amanda. Um, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen, which has a bunch of images and um, some, let's see, the awkwardness of watching me set up my program, sorry. Uh, so here you get a little installation view, a photograph of the installation that you can now see as Amanda mentioned uh, in Montpelier at the Vermont uh, History Museum the original Sheldon relic chair of 1884 that I'll be talking a little more about today and our 2018 version of the Sheldon relic chair. Um, so this project was really inspired by an object at the Henry Sheldon Museum of Vermont History here in Middlebury, um, which will be reopening to the public again soon. Um, Henry Sheldon was from Salisbury, Vermont and moved to Middlebury um, around 1840. And over the course of his life, he became really fascinated with ideas of history and how to preserve it, how to preserve not only Middlebury, very local history, but also um, items and objects of national and international significance. Um, and in the 1880s, this was really reaching feature, uh, fever pitch, as I think you can see from in this quote from his diary, he talked about um, in his in his diary, he recorded all kinds of activities that he was engaged in, writing to um, far-flung correspondents, asking for donations to the museum, and doing very what might seem like very quotidian things, like the newspaper, uh, to bind them, to preserve them for future generations. Um, so he was really interested in collecting all aspects of daily life, the life of daily Vermonters, um, not, necessarily, ne not necessarily political or military leaders, um, but the kind of quotidian objects that we really value nowadays for understanding um, the everyday life of people. Let's see if I can advance my slide. So like I said, you can still uh, visit the museum today. It's still standing um, in the town center of Middlebury. And this, kind of idea of collecting artifacts of the past, uh, what Amanda uh, and the title of today's program referred to as relics has a really long um, and distinguished history. Um, some of the earliest collections of relics were from uh, early Christian cultures um, who sought and preserved 
items related to saints. And these were sometimes um, objects from things that saints or holy figures had touched, um, like the Shroud of Turin or uh, Notre Dame famously has the crown of thorns that Jesus supposedly wore um, during the crucifixion um, to actual fragments of saints' bodies. And you see here a fragment of bone um, from St. Louis the Ninth, um, or on the right, uh, this reliquary that would have been um, a display case for a part of a fragment of a saint's arm as well. And in early American culture, this tradition continued, but instead of collecting objects related to saints, it was more often about items uh, related to the founding of the American Republic, um, especially people like George Washington. Um, and you see here two kind of different examples of early relic culture. This fragment from George Washington's coffin, which is kept in very kind of rough, ragged shape and just with its um, kind of notation that signifies that it's not a random scrap of wood, but instead from this very important um, artifact. And below, um, objects from this famous collection, the Rygart collection um, of relics in which many of those fragments of wood have been turned or carved into more settings. And this practice of keeping fragments of historical objects might seem kind of disturbing to us right now. It's a um, pretty destructive project, uh, process and project. You're taking a small piece of something historically noteworthy. So in this instance, fragments of the Star Spangled Banner. Um, when the Star Spangled Banner, the famous flag flown over Fort McHenry in the War of 1812 was put on display, many people took souvenirs and little clippings from it. So if you see, if you go to see the uh, Star Spangled Banner at the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian in Washington DC today, the losses and the fragments that are missing from the Star Spangled Banner are not age or insect damage, but also from people taking actual pieces of the flag home with them. So you see two examples of that here on the left, um, an artifact that was sold at auction in 2014 and on the right, um, three stripes from the Library of Company of Philadelphia. And so these uh, practices really ranged from all kinds of objects. We've seen wooden ones, we've seen fabric. Um, a famous, another famous example is this piece of Plymouth Rock, um, now also at the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian. Um, and these objects were often inscribed um, with information about the collectors and when and where they had taken those objects as kind of advocating or authenticating the works. Um, they're one of my favorite relics are these examples of tea uh, that was collected on the shores um, in outside of Boston. Um, here, tea from the Boston Tea Party um, preserved in a glass vial and now in the collections of the American Antiquarian Society. Um, donated by Thaddeus Harris in 1840. And these are sometimes, um, as you're probably getting a sense, these are sometimes very quotidian objects that became famous through their contact with a famous historical event or a famous historical person um, or through damage as part of their um, participation or as, as they bore witness to an important aspect of American history. Um, so in this instance, the head of a doll um, rescued from the ruins of the Chicago fire at the Ch Chicago Historical Society. And you can see along with that, um, this display case of many quotidian objects that have been damaged. So this idea that um, everyday objects can stand wit bear witness to important historical events and either through their signs of damage can add this kind of affective, emotional um, connection to the past, um, but also maybe the ways in which these relics then give us empathy for the people of the past. We might be encouraged then to imagine the little girl who played with this doll, um, whose body, whose cloth body was lost in the fire, um, but whose porcelain head remains. 
um, sometimes they're transformed into collectible items. In this instance, uh, the Chicago courthouse bell famously uh, melted during the Chicago fire or it, it was ruined. And so it was melted down and turned into these uh, either bell charms or metals that were um, seen as uh, possible ways of raising funds to help recover from the Chicago fire. And wooden relics, again in a moment, are a really important part of relic keeping. We saw some of the fragments from George Washington's casket. Um, another famous uh, tree or what became a wooden relic was what was seen as, or what was called the Charter Oak, an important site in Connecticut history that also has a connection to Henry Sheldon's relic chair. Um, this tree stood in Connecticut and had um, holes in it from various uh, rot or storms. And during the evolution, people hid the charter um, in the kind of bowels of this tree. Tragically, in the 1850s, the tree came down in a storm and a huge industry of relics um, cropped up as a result. Um, one of the things that's so fantastic about this particular example is it's a painting of the relic of the Charter Oak as it was still standing in the 1850s, framed by um, a really intricately carved um, frame material of the Charter Oak itself. So it's this really interesting, um, in academic circles, we would talk about the semiotics of representation, the ways in which this conveys both the outward appearance of the tree itself and is surrounded by a medium of the tree, of that very tree. Um, and people also transformed a relic chair, out relic furniture from the tree itself. So we see a very elaborate example here um, of relic furniture carved from the Charter Oak um, with this beautiful sheet that's engraved attesting to the validity and the authenticity of the Charter Oak. I find uh, this example really fascinating because it uh, incorporates a lot of the kind of woody elements of the tree. You have this very naturalistic appearance um, where you can see the kind of tree limbs and branches evoked by the burls of the wood um, as well. So you can see here um, a little better detail of the kind of label of provenance, the chain of ownership, um, attesting to who collected the wood from the Charter Oak, um, who the witnesses were in attesting to that kind of chain of uh, possession. So I've sketched out ways in which uh, relics could be both very quotidian objects, just tiny fragments, or they could be sculpted into really elaborate forms. And I think it's very interesting to contrast uh, Henry Sheldon's relic chair with Charter Oak uh, chair. And we'll turn more to that in a moment. Um, but I just wanted to address the ways in which we, we might think about um, this practice of relic keeping as seeming very foreign to us or very far away. Um, but I'm bringing in this uh, kind of counter example of the ways in which people collected fragments of the Berlin Wall, as you see here, um, or in more recent history, um, people collected artifacts related um, to scraps and fragments found at the site of both the World Trade Center and at the Pentagon. Um, these objects then become memorials in a kind of way, recalling these tragic events of history and the people who were lost on those days. So Henry Sheldon's relic chair, as I've mentioned, um, it's this very eclectic um, Windsor chair and each of the top, the spindles in these top two rows are relics. They are taken from fragments of um, sites of significant cultural, regional, local, and national history. And Henry Sheldon was wonderful about documenting almost everything he did. Um, and especially even with 
in the case of this chair, there's a great record book that you're seeing a shot of here um, where he outlines which each spindle, which the source material for each spindle on the chair. And these range from kind of his grandfather's house to a piece of the Charter Oak, Connecticut, a piece from the Constitution, Middlebury's Episcopal Church um, and Colonel Church, for example, um, California Redwood, all kinds of materials linked to different sites of national and regional importance and history. I just got a notice that my internet connection was unstable, so I might be coming in and out, but we'll do the best we can. It's 2020. Um, and Sheldon shaped most of these spindles into this kind of beautiful, uniform, curvaceous, uh, curving forms um, using a lathe, but he isn't disguising the fact that these fragments came from different sites and in fact often highlighting that by having, although the, the frame of the chair is painted in a uniform kind of pale gray blue color, the relics are kept as almost bare wood, just with a little bit of varnish on top. And indeed, in many instances, you can see that he didn't have enough material to um, carve the spindle. And so instead it's kept as that kind of rough hewn uh, square plank, really emphasizing or evoking the reader's curiosity about where they might come from. Um, so I've given you kind of an overwhelming list here of all of the different sites from which um, Henry Sheldon, the chair, where he collected the objects from. Um, this central panel, for example, is from former president Andrew Johnson's tailor shop um, in Greenville, Tennessee. And you can also see how the chair, how the seat of the chair has this um, kind of square plank in the middle of it. And that's because it too is a relic taken from the defendant's bench at the Middlebury Courthouse. Some of these artifacts were um, kind of pilfered, or not pilfered, selected and taken or donated um, by people from sites that still exist, that are still standing. In other instances, the 1880s had a very different approach to historic preservation. Many of these historic sites were actually being destroyed um, at the time of writing. So, for example, the Declaration House in Philadelphia um, was being demolished. And so Henry secured a fragment um, from that site as well. I should maybe back up and also say that some of this kind of fascination, Henry was building this chair in the early 1880s. And a lot of this fascination with preserving American history, although it was in contrast with um, efforts to modernize cities and demolish urban historic centers um, was also bumping up against antiquarian and preservation interests that were really sparked by the 1876 World's Fair in Philadelphia, um, celebrating the centennial of the United States. So that in some ways might have inspired Henry Sheldon to start this project. So you're getting a sense of different views of the chair. Um, and you can really get a sense of how these woods vary um, in the different kind of composition. So inspired by Henry Sheldon's work and being really fascinated by this chair, I, I wanted to learn more about it. And I thought a great way to do so would be to teach a class on the chair and enlist students in working on this project together. Um, and so in the winter of 2018, that um, this class that a man of uh, material culture and folk um, and students really benefited from close work with the chair. It's kind of hard in 2020 to look back at these photographs when we're all um, physically distancing from one another and wearing masks and not gathering in public spaces. Uh, but the Sheldon Museum were really wonderful hosts and collaborators in this project, um, Mary Manley, Bill Brooks, and Eva Garcelon Hart were wonderful collaborators and invited us to come study the chair 
um, closely in person, as you can see here, um, paired and contrasted the forms of Henry's eclectic Windsor chair with um, the traditional forms of uh, Windsor chairs in United States culture. Um, and Eva Garcelon Hart, as you can see here, invited us into the archives. And so each student took on the task of researching one or two spindles, um, delving through the archives to find how Henry Sheldon acquired these objects, um, what kind of correspondence networks he set up in this process. And then we built a website with our findings, um, conducting research also into the sites that he chose and what kind of cultural and historical significance those places had. Um, and you can visit that site. Um, I think you can see the address here, um, sites.middlebury.edu slash Sheldon Relic Chair. Um, so I hope you'll visit that site. We also wanted to get a sense of the materiality of the chair, not just the kind of papers and historical documents related to it, but what it would have been like to build the chair itself and what kind of labor and uh, material knowledge went into making the chair. And so we collaborated with a colleague in our department here at Middle um, Art Biotechnician, Colin Boyd, who you see here, um, working with students. He taught us how to use a lathe and turn wood ourselves. Um, you can see the templates that he built um, so that we could copy Henry Sheldon's uh, spindles and the process of doing this. And Colin also um, worked to acquire some of the actual samples of wood used in the chair, like red cedar, um, oak, pine. All of these have very different material qualities. Some of them are hot, harder, some of them are softer, some of them are easier to carve. Um, so we could get a sense of what that process of making was like. And beyond the sense of the spindles, we also wanted to understand what building the chair itself was like. And we worked with an amazing uh, chair wright and furniture maker, Timothy Clark, um, who's based in Waltham. Um, he's also a Middlebury College alum, I think class of 85. He builds beautiful chairs and bed Windsor furniture. He also has a website. I think it's timothyclark.com, um, but you can Google Timothy Clark furniture. It'll come up. And he really graciously hosted us at his workshop to show us the process of what went into building a chair like this in the 1880s. Um, on the left, you see a student using a shaving horse. On the right, you see Tim showing us uh, the kinds of tools you would use to carve out the seat um, of the chair. And we commissioned Tim to build a copy of the chair. The Chipstone Foundation, based in Milwaukee, helped uh, with to commission a copy of the chair itself. Um, and so Tim built us this beautiful replica that we decided to populate with our own relics. So we would think about what should the relics of 2018 be? And um, in Montpelier, in the galleries itself, we have a, a kind of participatory, I'm not quite sure how participatory we can be right now in COVID times. Um, but we really are encouraging visitors to think about what relics you would choose for your chair. Would you include a mask in 2020? Would you include the pattern for a fabric, uh, for a fabric mask that you used? Um, would there be, for example, something from a COVID testing site? Um, so we thought really carefully in class about what Henry Sheldon included and what he excluded and what it would be feasible, ethical, interesting for us to try to collect. Um, and we set about trying to acquire those relics. Um, and then we worked with Colin and Tim to work about forming those objects that we selected um, into functional, aesthetically pleasing spindles. So you can see here part of the process of thinking about what that might entail. Um, our brainstorming included objects like um, something from the grounds of Robert Frost's uh, cabin. Um, students wanted to include a reference to uh, athletics at Middlebury College. And so a former coach donated a hockey stick that had been used by Middlebury College athletes. We have bike handlebars. 
um, we kind of, we realized that, that Henry Sheldon's vision, version of Vermont history was very white. And we had hoped to, in some ways, incorporate, we thought about how we might be able to acknowledge and incorporate the important role of the Abenaki people in Vermont history. Ultimately, it felt like that would be too, um, it would perpetuate further violence to incorporate a fragment of an object. Um, and so we did not approach the Abenakis uh, about whether they would want to include something or not. But that might be something for further discussion about what does it mean to, in some, in some cases, violently extricate these objects from their context. We did want to pay heed to the important contemporary events of 2018. Um, as some of you might remember that year, unfortunately, this is becoming more and more common, but uh, 2017, late 2017, early 2018, saw really destructive and terrifying wildfires um, in California and the Western United States. Because Henry Sheldon had included a piece of California redwood in the original chair, um, we thought that that would make an interesting parallel um, between the 1884 and the 2018 chair. Um, so I corresponded with a colleague at another institution whose family um, has a farm or a ranch in California and their property had been burned. You see an image of that um, on the right. And they sent along part of a fence post built of California redwood that had been burned in the process. And so uh, Colin built this beautiful mold and we encased the charred redwood in um, acrylic so that it would maintain some sort of structural integrity, um, but still embody that connection to uh, contemporary history. In the spring of 2018, a storm brought down a historic tree planted by George Washington at Mount Vernon. So that's kind of the more historical context of the chairs. And we wrote to a colleague here, you can see um, Adam Irby sent us part of the hem uh, that was felled and Colin and I worked to transform that tiny log <laughs> into a functional spindle again. Um, and like Henry Sheldon, we're keeping all of the correspondence related to this project as well to kind of document the chain of, um, chain of command as it were. Students were really excited about incorporating something related to the seat of power in Vermont. Um, and so we contacted uh, the Vermont State Curator, uh, David Schutz, and he really graciously sent us a piece of the copper roof, um, the gilded copper roof that was currently under, then currently undergoing um, renovations, the copper gilded roof from the Vermont State House, the dome of the Capitol. Um, and so we tried to incorporate that as well. Um, so it's, it was a really exciting collaborative project that um, built a lot of community and it's a little, like I said, bittersweet looking back on it from the perspective of 2020. Um, we had a small exhibit, as you can see here at the Sheldon Museum in Middlebury. Um, and as Amanda mentioned, it's currently on view at the galleries. You can see both Henry Sheldon's 1884 chair and our 2018 chair. And I would love to talk with you guys about what kind of relics you would want to include for 2020. So. Maybe we can open up to Q and A. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I'm I'm happy to to take any questions. If anyone has any questions in uh, in the comments, you're welcome to use that chat function to, you know, expand further on that question of what how would we make a relic chair in 2020? What kinds of pieces uh, would we use for that? Or any questions about anything specifically um, that was discussed in this talk? Um, I can kick it off with the first question. When when you were looking at your survey of of relics in American history, um, did you find that there were any particular um, individuals who seem to have just a high concentration of, of relics. You mentioned a little bit about George Washington earlier. Does, does he win or are there other American history figures that just seem to attract uh, relics collecting? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think George Washington is definitely the epicenter <laughs> of a lot of relic keeping and 
it's maybe in keeping with the kind of famed uh, George Washington slept here um, site markers and location markers. Abraham Lincoln actually has a lot of artifacts related uh, to him as well. And I think both of them play a kind of similar role in American history, but the uh, site, the boarding house across the street from Ford's theater where Lincoln was shot um, and taken after he was assassinated, um, that boarding house actually was completely ransacked in the aftermath of his death. Um, so many souvenir hunters and relic keepers came wanting a piece of the room that bore witness to Abraham Lincoln's death. And so pieces of wallpaper, the curtains, um, all kinds of things were, were taken from that room as well. Great, thanks. Um, we have a couple of questions in the, the comments. Um, the first one, the Vermont Historical Society has many odd relics in its collection. Are we planning a short-term exhibit on these pieces? Um, that one, <laughs> that one, that one I can I can address. We do not currently have plans um, to exhibit relics as a, as a, an exhibit per se. We have included some of our relic um, objects in other uh, in other exhibits. Um, and actually, before this talk, um, Professor Fauch and I were corresponding a little bit about some of those pieces. Though, so um, so there may be inspiration for a future project um, that could be a lot of fun. But as of right now, we have we have no plans um, to do that from the Vermont Historical Society's perspective. But um, we shall see. Um, we also have a question. Um, oh, I'm just going to say. There was a great exhibit about relics at the Smithsonian a few years ago called uh, Souvenir Nation. And I think there's an online exhibit about that. And uh, there's definitely a small book catalog. Um, but yeah, I love relics and would encourage more <laughs> exhibitions and work about them. Yeah, we have. We have some really cool ones in our collection, um, so we'll see. Um, question for uh, another one from the chat. Um, Sadie asks, what do you think distinguishes a relic or gives a relic value? Is it for collecting or studying or using in collective history? Do relics hold value because of their story, because of their age, or do they hold some inherent value as the objects they themselves are? So complicated, complicated and thoughtful question for you from a former student. Um, unsurprisingly, Sadie asks a really thoughtful and good um, thought provoking question. Um, and I think it's such a complicated question that um, I'd love for, I'd love to have the chance to discuss further. I think often there is this notion of, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, um, what Walter Benjamin would have referred to as aura, the idea that this original object has some kind of tangible connection to history, to the past, um, or to a significant person. So it wouldn't necessarily, a relic wouldn't necessarily be the same as an artifact, an 18th century button, but if it were an 18th century button that was from George Washington's coat that he had worn at the Treaty of Paris, or <laughs> during his farewell address. I think that then, so there's some sort of tie to a significant person or a significant event, like I mentioned with the Chicago fire relics that it, it and it's, it's something about this physical tie, I think, um, to either a person or a specific event, if that makes sense. Um, we, we value a lot of old historical artifacts and objects now, but I think there is something, um, things are bumped up to a different echelon <laughs> if they have a tie to a significant person. And this is something we also debated in that 2018 class. Um, does it count to have a normal, a regular pen? That's different from a pen that was signed, that was used to sign a bill into law, for example. So that pen has greater resonance, even if it is the same make factory issue. <laughs> um, they 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 have different resonances, maybe. Yeah, it, it it strikes me that there there are connections to also that sense of place. 
Uh, you know, they mentioned that George Washington slept here, that there is, there is some kind of um, emotional resonance that feels similar to standing in a specific place where something happened versus holding, like you said, a button from a coat that was there when it happened. There's, there's some sort of emotional physicality almost mm -hmm. um, that makes those connections. It reminds me of the Lin-Manuel Miranda, the room where it happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's it's the, the thing that was in the room where it happened, and it is above and beyond that that sense of them just as artifacts. Yeah, um, Eliza is uh, mentions that a few years ago she got the chance to see one of George Washington's coats in the collection at Mount Vernon. One of the coat tails was almost entirely missing because it had been cut up for relics. Um, and she's wondering what more you can say about ob objects that are missing pieces um, because they've been turned into relics, whether that that sort of becomes part of their story or any other reflections you have on that. Yeah, that is another great question. Um, I think there is absolutely this tension between uh, destruction, destructive acts and constructive acts. Um, and I had a really nice conversation with the artist Dario Robledo, um, who often incorporates uh, historical artifacts into his contemporary works of art. And so he helped me think about that kind of reuse or reactivation of objects from the past as a constructive act, not just a destructive one. Um, but absolutely, I imagine there are a lot of textile conservators who shake their heads about um, these now, what we would see as damaged objects, but absolutely it bears witness not only to the event for which George Washington wore that coat or witnessed the Battle of Fort McHenry in the case of the Star Spangled Banner, um, but also to uh, the reverence that people had. And we might think of that as a kind of contradictory thing that that's maybe almost an iconoclastic act to take a fragment um, from, from this, from these important historical objects. Um, but it, I think it, it speaks to kind of different perspectives towards history and for individuals to hold onto a piece of that. There are very different regulations now, actually the National Park Service prohibits <laughs> any collection of anything from a historic site, um, which I think is a direct result of these kinds of practices. Um, for example, we contacted the Andrew Johnson historic site, which was doing renovations, um, and I think installing an HVAC system, which likely means that old beams of former President Andrew Johnson's house would have been cut to make room for the vents and things like that. And they have a very strict policy that even if things were being removed or destroyed as part of uh, conservation work, they could not be given to the general public or to anyone. Um, and I think it's part of this desire to discourage the practice of relic keeping. Yeah, it's interesting to reflect to the Constitution, uh, piece from the USS Constitution that was in Harry Sheldon's chair. That is a ship that still actively turns itself over on a regular basis because so many pieces of it are, are continually replaced. It's that argument, that ship of Theseus argument, is it the same ship now? And you can actually still buy pieces of the Constitution um, as they continue to do work on it. It's, it's actually become a sort of small revenue source um, is, is continuing to use that. Um, that would in other in other ways. So that's a totally different approach to it. And I think it raises interesting questions about authenticity too. Like a lot of, there's kind of a joke that if you assembled all of the wood that is from Washington's coffin or from the Charter Oak, it would fill rooms and rooms and rooms. Um, so I think I think that tension is interesting too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lucinda is asking, is Henry's chair unique in being a relic chair that is made from a lot of different relic pieces, or do you know of other similar examples from the time period? What a great question, Lucinda. Um, I need to go back in my files, probably. Um, I think the, the closest example that comes to mind right now is... Um, Actually, we were just talking about this, Amanda. The, this, another collector from Massachusetts, Reuben Reed, um, was collecting similar relic, relics, fragments, um, artifacts. And I recently came across, not only did he make gavels that he built out of a bunch of different forms of wood and the Vermont Historical Society has an example of that, but I also came across a ruler that he had built like a 
12 inch ruler and each inch was marketed with a tiny chip of wood from a different site. And so it had a little, he also had a little notebook that went with this that corresponded, you know, what one through 12 were. Um, other parallels that come to mind are the hair work wreaths that we see in many historical societies now, um, in which family members or extended kinship networks um, donated locks of hair and wove these really beautiful um, leaf or floral forms and then brought them together to form a unified wreath that's kind of a literalized family tree in some ways, um, incorporating the hair of different members of the family. And those also often had little diagrams enumerating who's, who was included and represented. Thanks. Um, following up with the comments, um, Eliza comments that she definitely agrees with you that there's absolutely some connection to textiles in the clipping um, of various pieces and then having pieces that exist now that have losses um, because of relic collection. So there's definitely something going on with textiles there for sure. Um, uh, Sadie is uh, giving two suggestions for 2020 things, uh, a piece of a hospital peg or a leg from the couch in her house <laughs> where we're all spending a great deal of time now and asks, do you think this chair functions as a kind of different take on the, the idea of the cabinets of curiosity? Yeah, I think that's a great uh, notion that these functional, repurposing these fragments into something functional, aesthetic, and beautiful in addition to um, their kind of aura I think Henry Sheldon had both. I think he, he, his museum in many ways was a cabinet of curiosities and he did have actual cabinets or cases um, with some of these artifacts, um, pipes that had been smoked by famous individuals, uh, for example. And yeah, I think that creation of this kind of trans, this transformation of the objects into a functional, um, piece is something that's really compelling and strange. It's, it's showcasing these different objects and we could debate over whether that then makes this more than the sum of its parts or less if, you know, it doesn't mean more to have a chair that was present at the signing of the Declaration of Independence versus a chair that has a spindle from the signing of the Declaration of Independence and from the USS Constitution and what have you. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear more thoughts about that. Yeah, well, if anyone else has any thoughts, please please do add them in the in the chat. Um, do you have any sense of when there, Sheldon intended his chair to be functional or was he intending it as a display piece from day one? That's a great question. Um, he called it a memorial chair in a lot of his, in his diaries um, and in some of the correspondence. It's actually a very uh, tiny chair. It's, if you try to, I've sat in the copy, not in the original, um, and it definitely makes me wanna turn my shoulders in um, because the, the curve of the back of the chair is so extreme. Um, and we could debate about whether that, some of that is about the kind of myth of 19th century people being smaller um, than we are today. Uh, I think, I don't, I haven't seen documentation of how he used the chair or where it was on display, whether he invited people to sit in it. Um, there was another chair in his house slash museum that was built from um, the courthouse, I believe. And that was more of a rocking chair. It was all from the same source of wood. Um, and I think that was something that he sat in and it was definitely more comfortable and inviting. Um, I think there was something kind of I, I, don't, I go back and forth between thinking there was something impish and humorous and kind of daring in Henry Sheldon's approach or thinking that he was a very uh, judgmental person because the seat of the chair was taken from, as I mentioned, the defendant's bench. And there was a inscribed passage about uh, how this was the seat where criminals and prisoners sat awaiting judgment. Um, and so this notion that you would be invited in to his study and then find yourself sitting in this kind of seat of judgment, um, I think is really 
interesting to think about. And I, I don't have enough of a sense of his personality to know whether it was this more witty approach or more of a judging, judging approach. Yeah, that's interesting to think about for sure. Um, so Eliza has, a, has another question. Um, I'm really enchanted by the idea of turning the wooden relics into something quote, greater than the sum of their parts by crafting them into a new object, um, very much not best practice today, which might be sad. Just a, a comment um, there. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about what, it, much as you did, whether this is a practice that, that may be repeated um, by that. I know I have family members who have used uh, sentimental trees to turn them into pieces of furniture in their houses. So there may be, you know, some slight variations on that. Um, we don't as much collect pieces from historic sites anymore, but we certainly do still transform you know, sentimental pieces into other things. I'm thinking t-shirt quilts might mm -hmm. be uh, sort of a modern variation on, on that, that idea of, of um, textiles that were there when they happened into, into things. Yeah, um, I think it's maybe something that's more, a more common practice in kind of family or personal histories than public ones. Although I've been really fascinated to see different examples of kind of relic adjacent objects for sale in museum gift shops. Um, the National Archives sells paperweights and jewelry with pieces of red tape, the kind of the original red string that bound documents together. They, instead of just tossing the red tape that used to bind these documents together, they're now chopping them up and selling them as souvenirs. I think there's a company that sells uh, pieces from baseball, the seats at baseball stadiums, if they're undergoing renovation, they turn them into cufflinks, um, mm -hmm. things like that. The One of the funniest examples I've, I've seen, I think, was that the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum uh, manages uh, O'Keeffe's house in Abiquiu, and she had this really famous jade plant that is depicted in a lot of photographs of her home, and it, it's still living, but they were selling baby jade plants that were grown from cuttings of Georgia O'Keeffe's jade tree. So <laughs> that's really felt sort of a continually living, uh, living relic. Yeah. Well, it strikes me too that you were mentioning that that sort of commercialization has existed right alongside relic collecting right on through. So the idea of selling things now is is not a new one by any stretch. Absolutely. So. Um, I, I've been checking our Facebook uh, live as well for some comments while we've had along. We haven't had anything come in through there um, and we're winding down in the chat. Um, so is there anything else that, um, that you wanted to add or say before we close out our program today? I think I'm just so delighted that we're able to have this sense of community even in 2020. And I really appreciate you, Amanda, and the Vermont History Museum for making this happen. Um, I'm grateful to the folks at the Sheldon Museum for helping to make this whole project possible as well. So thanks to all of you. Yeah, well, and, and thank you so very much for, for joining us today, for, for participating virtually. Thank you to everyone who has followed along virtually. Um, as I said, this, this will be available as a recorded piece on the Vermont Historical Society's Facebook page. Um, we do have upcoming programming uh, continuing virtual for, for now, and you can learn more about that programming and about the work of the Vermont Historical Society um, for, by going to vermonthistory.org. Um, check out the, uh, the many things that we have available for you to do from home um, this, this summer. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you again, um, Ellery. And I, I hope you all have a, a lovely day. I'm looking forward to a lovely weekend. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Oop. I'm going to be hanging out for a minute, closing out all of the online pieces. Just.